get into our Sunday school lesson this morning, picking up Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 9. We, we pretty well kind of wound up last week noting that in verses 5 through 8, we have the king issuing a decree for the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. And this is the only clearly recorded decree decree for this in scripture and so it's from this point which is around 445 BC that we begin to count the 70 weeks of years that Daniel had uh, been prophesied about and Nehemiah is the is the man who realized that he was the person that God could use to bring this to pass and he went before the king and the king granted him his request and Picking up in verse 9 and 10, he says, So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent an army, sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Now, you know, in looking at chapter 1 into the first part of chapter 2. By the end of verse, verse 8, you know, Nehemiah can say, I've, I've got God's blessings. I've got the king's permission. I've got things going on. I'm going to have materials to rebuild the city. Everything is doing good. But we have something different here than we had with Ezra. Do you know what that is? Prophecy. Well, yeah, he prophecy being fulfilled in this man. Opposition. opposition. And as part of that opposition, we have in the, our verses before us that the king sent army officers and cavalry with me. Doesn't say anything about Nehemiah calling for prayer, calling for fasting. Ezra did. Remember, he set the people aside for three days. And told them to fast and pray for the safety. Nehemiah didn't see the need to do any of this. Was Nehemiah less faithful or further from God than Ezra was in this? No, he had armor with him. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's different and, and it's interesting because, you know, having the benefit of society or government is not a lack of faith but it can often be wisdom this was wisdom for nehemiah nehemiah wasn't going as a priest to reestablish the temple and worship the nations surrounding them didn't like ezra coming teaching the law teaching about returning to god but he was you know he was just a preacher Nehemiah was coming in as the governor of a province. Nehemiah was coming in as a political leader. He was coming in with clout from the king. So the, he, as he came in, the king wanted to make sure that everybody who saw Nehemiah recognized that this was a man of importance. And Nehemiah didn't buck that. If we can use or... If, if we can use the government to help us in doing God's will, it's not a lack of faith. It's really wisdom. Now, if Nehemiah had gone to Sanballat and Tobiah, these people around them, just by himself and said, listen, I'm the governor of Judea now. And I got a letter from the king that said, you're supposed to help me. What's the likelihood of him leaving there alive? Probably not real high. But when he came with the letters from the king and came with army officers and came with cavalry, Tobiah and Sanballat may not have liked what he was doing and would have liked to have gotten rid of him. But God had provided a providence so they couldn't. And I think it's just interesting, you know, and 
Nehemiah came, he didn't seem to buck this. He didn't, he didn't call for people to pray. He certainly had been praying himself. And he knew God was with him. So, you know, here's the, that, there was the difference. Ezra, and maybe Ezra had overstepped his confidence when he said, we don't need an army. God will take care of us. I got 30 tons of gold and 5,000 people. We don't need no protection at all. And he called for a fast and pray, probably to get their minds in a place to where he could figure out, well, did I, did I overstep here, Lord? He didn't. But he called for that because he said he called for safety, prayer for safety. Nehemiah knew he had God's providence with him, knew he had God's blessing with him, and didn't see a reason or need. He didn't overstep. He just followed what the Lord had provided for him through his position as being a, an advisor and counselor to the king. Uh, now, verse 10 tells us that when Sanballat and Tobiah heard about this, they were very much disturbed. That's probably an understatement. That someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Just because God is with us doesn't mean that if everything's going to be a bed of roses. I think we all realize that but sometimes we, we seem to be caught by surprise when we're, we're doing what God wants us to do. We're in the center of God's will. We've been praying. We've been seeking. We, we know we're doing the right thing. And we run up against a wall. Here was a wall. At least two. We're going to find out there's three elements of this wall a little bit, a little bit further into the passage. And we tend to wonder, well, what happened? If I, have I lost God? No. The world will not like what you do for Jesus Christ. Anytime, every time, anywhere, and everywhere. There may be some that are moved, but you will find that we all have those who do not care about what we are doing for God. And in particular, these guys who were over the surrounding areas, they saw that this man now was going to be a political force to deal with. Jerusalem was going to be rebuilt. There was going to be a, a political power here. And they were quite concerned over this. You remember the letter that uh, Ezra records that several years earlier had been sent to this same king. And he stopped the building of the city. Let me ask you this. In Ezra 4, the letter is about the rebuilding of the city. And he stopped it. Not the temple, but the city. Now he's sending Nehemiah to build the city. It seems, it's, it's not clearly stated in Scripture, but it seems from those two passages that maybe the exiles who had returned and were seeking to rebuild the, the temple at the same time were seeking to rebuild the city. Kind of makes sense. You know, if they're going to build a temple, they want to be able to protect it. But could it be that the reason their walls had been torn down by chapter 1 of Nehemiah his brethren are saying the walls are broken down. Well, yeah, the walls got broken down by Nebuchadnezzar 70 years before. So evidently, the wall had begun to be rebuilt by these returned exiles. The letter that was sent, it's recorded in Ezra chapter 4, to this same king, he ordered it stopped. Probably because of the war that was going on between Egypt, the rebellion in Egypt that was being assisted by the Greeks and Persia. And it could be that maybe the children of Israel returned exiles were jumping the gun on God's prophecy, God's promise. 
Remember, the Lord told Daniel that there would be a decree. There was no decree to rebuild the city before Nehemiah. Perhaps they had jumped the gun. They were, they were not fulfilling prophecy according to God's timeline. The Lord wants his will done, but he's got his plan and his will and his timing for it to be done. And we can think, well, God's told us to rebuild the temple. We may as well go ahead and rebuild the city while we're at it. No, he didn't tell you to do that. He told you to build the temple. And there's times that we as believers can read a prophecy, read a passage of scripture, and feel like we need, to, we need to do this, and yeah, we need to do this, but we don't need to do that. Not yet. It's just interesting to think about how, you know, the Lord wants us to follow his leading. And how easy it is, is it for us to jump ahead of him? Well, Lord, I know you're going to want me to do this too. Maybe, maybe not. Do what he wants us to do and follow his lead to do the next thing he wants us to do. Questions, comments on that? I just think it's interesting. But we have in verse 10 with these two gentlemen, Sanballat and Tobiah, and Tobiah is a name, you remember back in Ezra chapter two, there was a Tobiah, a family by the name of Tobiah, that couldn't prove their genealogy. Some commentators note that this Tobiah here could have been related to that family there. And the historical documents of that time mention a, a powerful family called Tobiah all the way down to the time of the Maccabees. And that would have been 160 something BC, give or take 10, 15 years there. So Nehemiah was being introduced by the, with these two men that there was going to be opposition, not only from the outside, but there may very well be opposition from the inside in rebuilding the temple. In rebuilding or doing something for God, it's generally a combination of those who are clearly outside and those with links to the inside that will be set against us as we do God's work. So this is, this is the introduction to that. Verse 11 says, I went to Jerusalem. And after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Now, th this, this is interesting. <laughs> this is a secret inspection that Nehemiah does when he gets there. He spends the first three days evidently settling in. You know, he'd, he'd been traveling for nearly a thousand miles to get there. And now he probably took the first three days that's recorded here to settle in. But then he went secretly. We don't know how long he did this. It's probably longer than one night. But either way, he went secretly and examined what lay before him. And he hadn't told anybody what God had put in his heart to do. Why do you think he was so secretive? I think it's easier to go actually see what needs to be done on your own accord other than trusting what other people are going to tell you. I think he's just checking everybody down to see what really needs to be done. 
And we would call that planning. One of the great lessons that we have in Nehemiah is teaching us and helping us to understand planning. That Nehemiah was a man of faith, indeed. And he had vision, and he had courage, and he had determination. But to be able to move a people to take on a work really takes planning. And indeed, he wanted to get a handle. He wanted to see what the situation was. He wanted to assess what was needed, what the issues were. Where were the good spots to build? Where were the bad spots? It was going to take more work to build. And also to avoid the distractions. We've often heard you know, the phrase, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen. Well, can't you imagine if Nehemiah had gone and said, listen, I'm planning on rebuilding the city. Who wants to help me look this thing over and talk about it? Can you imagine what would have happened? How many ideas would have been given him? How many discussions would have been going on to say, I don't know why Nehemiah is doing this. It looks like to us. Over here would be a better place to start. But Nehemiah is going over. You know, Nehemiah wanted to avoid all of that. He did it secretly because sometimes it's just best to get the facts and get the idea straight in your own mind before letting somebody else know what's going on. And someone must understand the big picture of things to be able to answer all of the little picture questions that come up. Nehemiah wanted to have a good handle in his own mind of what lay ahead of him because he knew there would be a ton of questions and a ton of things to deal with in rebuilding a city that had been torn down. Uh, leadership is about seeing what can be done and who needs to be doing it and knowing when to be quiet and when to present. How often have you ever been in a meeting or been around a group where there was someone or maybe a couple of people that simply could not wait to speak up? They had to be able to tell everybody what to do. Ever been in that type, been around that type of person? And you know the difficulty that creates. Nehemiah being a wise leader, knew, I don't need to say anything yet. I will be creating more trouble than I can deal with before I actually get into the work. So being able to, to know when to keep our mouths shut. And there have been times that, you know, in my own work experience, I've gotten an email. Bam! And just by the mercy of God, <laughs> I wasn't fired, you know. Um, <clears throat> actually was called on the carpet one time at NC State for responding a little aggressively to a statement. And thought I was going to be brought up before the human resources. I mean, the person that I had offended, really wanted me brought before human resources. Now, it wasn't allowed, because if it had, I was going to get me a lawyer to come in. I mean, it was to that level. Um, but it was because I fired off without really thinking about it. I allowed my emotions, I allowed my personal feelings who I felt had been offended to take control rather than keeping my mouth shut and my fingers still, you know, until I could get a better handle. And it was almost a year later before me and this other person met and got it all straightened out. And it was much more easily straightened out. Had I used a little more wisdom and common sense, I might would have, you know, avoided an unpleasant 
situation. Nehemiah was a man who saw the issues coming up and realized he had to keep his own head in order to help everybody else keep theirs. And not only this, you know, he now, after assessing the situation, the scripture tells us, he, you know, by night he went out and looked at all of this and everything. Now, verse 17, then he says to the people, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Nehemiah, in planning, showed good leadership skill. But the second area of his planning was, how do I motivate a people to do this? Now, the city of Jerusalem wasn't real big. By the time Nehemiah gets it finished, it's only about 40 acres in size, according to historical documents. Solomon's city of Jerusalem, which was the one destroyed, covered about 160 acres. So what Nehemiah rebuilt was only about 25% of the size of the original. But how do you motivate a people to do this? Remember, it had been nearly a hundred years since they had returned. And they had been beaten down. They had been rejected by the king on his orders. They had these surrounding enemies. How do you get people who have been discouraged to realize you can? That was the next challenge that he faced. Look at what he said in verses 17 and 18. He told them first that he identifies with their issue. Look at what he said. Yeah. How to motivate. ID with the people. If you can't read that, I, that believe me, that's what I said. Um, he said, look at the trouble we are in. Now, if it's only somebody else's problem, you will never have the unity of effort to be able to succeed. Nehemiah identified with the people and the situation, the trouble we are in. Until something becomes ours, it's always easy to look somewhere else for blame and for inaction. But Nehemiah, being led by the Spirit, no doubt, and very wise, identified with the situation the people were in. He said, we are in this. Man, you're the governor. You got the king's ear. You ain't in no trouble. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm one of you. And he was honest about the problem and the facts. He says, Jerusalem, he was honest. He said, Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates are torn down, burned up. I think he really was being pretty honest about what the situation was. He didn't come in and say, well, you know, I see a great and glorious city built here. We're going to do marvelous things. I know. And everybody else is looking around saying, I don't see nothing but a pile of rocks. He was honest with them. You can't get buy-in from folks unless you're honest. Now, you know, I know this is a Sunday school class. This is not some kind of business for me. And believe me, I am no great businessman by any stretch. Just ask my wife. Uh, but the wisdom that is provided us in Scripture helps us not only in our spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ, but the examples of the Old Testament, which Paul said, 
The Old Testament is examples. They are examples for us to learn of how we can face different situations. Nehemiah faced a really difficult situation, and he had to motivate a really difficult group of people. He identified with them. He was honest with them. And along with that idea of honesty, unless we are honest and clear about what we are facing, early emotion, early excitement, early, you know, yeah, let's go, we can do this, will burn up pretty quickly when you have to start lifting rocks. Nehemiah wanted them to realize, you got a job ahead of you. But we can do it. He was committed to definite action as a response. He didn't just say, what do you think? He said, let's do this. He said, let's rise up and build. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And then he told them about the gracious hand of his God, what the king had said to him. You know, he helped them to understand the goodness that God had been showing him all through this. And as a result of this, the people said, let's start. The response of the people. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work how to motivate give all these three give us direction and it's a good thing to ask ourselves what's the direction of our lives what's the direction of our church what's the direction of this class Uh, having those three, we can help get a good handle on where we, where we need to go in the will of God. I think Nehemiah is just very interesting with that. But of course, like I said a while ago, you know, you start trying to do something for the Lord, you'll find somebody that don't like it. Verse 19, but when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem, here's the third guy, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Things had really begun to look good at the end of verse 18. Nehemiah had gotten a defeated people to begin to believe in the God who had brought them back to the land. And here's, here's I think, is an important point with this. If you don't think God really cares about you, it's going to play into how you see yourself and the ability to carry out what he has given you. You ever been in a place where you didn't think God cared about you? How did it affect the way you lived? We've heard of, of folks that because they've had difficulties and issues come up, they blamed God and said, God don't care about me. I ain't going to care about him. Never run into anybody like that. Ever been there yourself? Think about how it affected you. If we don't believe God cares for us, it's going to affect everything we do or say or think about our obedience to Jesus Christ. Nehemiah wanted these people to realize God does care. 
Look at the gracious hand of my God of what he has provided from the king. God is here. And these two antagonists that we read earlier, now joined by a third guy, Geshem. And he was an Arabian chieftain in Kedar, in the northwest of Africa. And his tribal confederation at that time ruled under Persia over an area that reached to Edom and southern Judah. That's why he's now being brought in. So why were these three so set against Nehemiah? Nobody likes God. <laughs> that's, that's a basic truth right there. Yeah, here's someone who's coming in and going to upset our apple cart, and we don't like it. I've told you the story, I think. It's been a while since I've mentioned it, but I heard of a young man that was, well, I don't know, he wasn't exactly a young man. He was a retired military, but he went to a little church down in South Carolina, Free Will Baptist Church. A little old church, didn't have a preacher. He told him, he said, listen, I'll come in. I'm retired. You don't have to pay me a salary. I got my own place to live. So really no expenses. I will come in and be your pastor. And from what I heard, he was a good preacher. People began to come to the church. Church began to grow. And they booted him out. They booted him out. Why? He threatened the power structure in that little congregation. It's amazing how vain people can be. You give somebody a little bit of power, authority. They think they're the king of Siam or somewhere, you know. And they will fight any perceived threat to their power. The church was growing. The church people were coming. It was doing good. But new people meant new sources of power, sources of re resources of use. More comfortable with it being the way it's always been. Me and my four are no more, and we're good with it, you know? <laughs> and churches all over the world have faced this. We ain't never done it this way. Okay. Maybe it's time to start. I mean, you know. I knew I'd finally struck a nerve somewhere in all this. I knew it would. And. Huh? <laughs> but, and it is, and, and we see this, you know. What we have experienced in our lives, in our relationship, in our time, history, in churches, this is, this is 2,500 years ago. They were having it then. And, yeah, you, you, you just can't fix stupid. You can't, you know. Uh, you can build a whole city, but you can't fix it, you know. Because uh, we're all carnal. We all have that sin nature. And it doesn't take much for us to allow that to take precedence over the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we begin to act in the flesh out of our own jealousy, our own whatever it might be. And all of a sudden we've made something much more complicated. It threatened their power. Now, the letters that Nehemiah had brought to these folks around him prevented them from right out attacking. They knew you buck the king, the whole Persian army's coming and we don't want to have to deal with that. But instead, they mocked and ridiculed the Jews. And it's interesting, sometimes we fear shame as much as and sometimes more than actual punishment for our faith. Especially when we have to live in the midst of it. You know, the old phrase, sticks and stones may break by bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, they will. Yeah, they will. What about our response when we're mocked and then it goes down to time and 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 time and
Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's coming for us. So we, we hear it. We read it every day. But Nehemiah, when he was faced with this, look at what he said. Verse 20. They asked him, what are you doing, rebelling? You know. He didn't fall and play into the verbal trap. Are you rebelling against the king? Now, if he'd have said, well, you crazy, I'm not trying to rebel against the king. It would have led to another question, and then to another question, and then to another question. He cut it off by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Do what? What, what, what are you, are you rebelling against the king? Don't play into the arguments of the world because you will never win. You may battle, you may reach a draw, but you will never win in the sense of changing their minds. And it may cost you and me some spiritual energy playing in to their traps, if you will. He turned it and responded by saying the God of heaven. He turned the whole political question away from the situation and put it in a proper context. And this is something I think we desperately need in our society today. We're seeing so many things that are so very wrong but it's being linked almost totally to some political issue. For Christians, it is never just a political issue. It is, what is God's word about this? And I think that we desperately need to remember that when we get into discussions. If God said it's wrong, I don't, it, it makes really no difference who the other people are that either agree or disagree. It's irrelevant. That doesn't mean you can't vote for a party that stands more for what you feel like you believe. But don't link the two together and make one, well, this is my party because I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute. When Joshua came before the Lord in the book of Joshua, and he asked the Lord, he said, whose side are you on? And God looked at him and said, I'm on my side. I don't have, you need to be on my side. I ain't worried about your sides. The important thing is you be on my side. And I think that's what we need to realize today. I think it will help us as we face the increasing and growing verbal attacked, verbal ridicule and mocking that we are getting in our world. He didn't use his authority. Notice when they ask him this, he didn't even use his authority. God is going to give us success. I mean, you know, he, he, he turned the whole thing around and said, this is a spiritual work that I am doing. He didn't even use his authority as governor. He could have, he could have answered these fellows and said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm as equal in political clout as you folks are. He didn't fall into the argument. He didn't buy into their arguments. And he avoided being caught in his words. If he had tried to answer from a political point of view, it could easily have been construed and sent back to the king. Well, this is what Nehemiah said, and Geshem, and Tobiah, and, you know, we heard it. And all of a sudden, Nehemiah either would have been recalled, or the king of Persia would have sent an army. He responded with faith in God, and he focused on the job. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. The best way to handle ridicule is to be successful in what you're doing. Stay with what you know God has given you. And he refused to compromise. 
He said, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Echoes what Ezra said back in Ezra chapter 4. And maybe Nehemiah was remembering the account of Ezra, of what happened when these folks tried to join in the rebuilding of the temple, you know. But he focused on his job. And the best way to shut people down is to be successful. You can't do it. You ain't. Yeah, what do you people think you're going to do? We're going to do what God wants us to do. He will give us success. And he defines, God defines his success. We don't. And the more successful you become, the more irritated people will be because you are successful. I have seen situations, and you probably have to, where people have tried to destroy other people. And because that person was successful, it did more to defeat the attack than anything they could have done. They stuck with what their job was, and they were successful in it. And it proved all the slanders and everything. This is slander here. Are you rebelling against the king? That's a slander. Our battles in our life is not over territory, but over faith. Yes, there was territory here. But Nehemiah saw that this was a God thing that had to be done. And there are times that we must draw the line in our spiritual lives. No, I'm not going to agree to this. No, I'm not going to do that. But, and he did. He said, listen, you have no right or historical right to this. You have no claim. We are the ones that God has appointed to do this, not you. And that type of separation needs to be maintained by us as Christians. Do not allow the world to build your house. Allow God to build your house. Stay with his work. That's, that's our important thing to do. Questions, comments? Making any sense? I'm either doing good or I'm really doing bad. One of the two up here, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Okay, Nehemiah moves on into chapter 3. Now, chapter 3 gives to us the work of the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. In the first 15 verses, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, you have the northern and the western walls being rebuilt. In chapter 3, verse 16 through verse 32, you have the eastern wall built. Now, we're not gonna, I'm not going to go into each and every verse, you know, uh, one, I probably can't pronounce all the names to begin with, and you know, but we're going to make some observations from the whole account of the building. Now, the whole chapter seems to be included as an after the fact. So Nehemiah is probably recounting here, you know, as a memoir of what of what had happened. But there are some particulars in this, in this chapter that really kind of stand out to us. Verse 5, we have the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Now, this little town of Tekoa was located southwest of Bethlehem. It was the home of Amos, the prophet, but at this time, it was near the border areas that were controlled by Geshem the Arab. And this may explain why some of the nobles were hesitant to put their shoulders to the work or their supervisors in with the common people. And this verse indicates that even with all that had happened, some folks may still not have been supportive of Nehemiah. The nobles didn't put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Why? I don't want to hack off Geshem over here. We see that sometimes. However, verse 7 tells us, look at verse 7. Next to them, repairs were made by the men from Gibeah and Mizpah.
Melchi of Gibeon and Jadon of Meroth, places under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. The governor of Trans-Euphrates, guess who he was? That was Sanballat. But these folks, even though they lived just as close as the folks in verse 5, they did do the work. There were, you will have people, some will be afraid of offending people that are around them, and some will say, I believe in what we're doing, we're going to continue to do it. Verse 12 tells us that Shalom and his daughters worked. And this was probably due to the fact that Shalom didn't have any sons, you know, which would make his daughters hold the birthright to the, to the area. Shalom, son of Haloshesh, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. And then you have verses 30 and 31 out of this passage. Next to him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zaleph, repaired another section. Next to them, Shalom, son of Berechiah, made repairs opposite his living quarters. Let me read that verse, next verse too. Next to him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and the merchants opposite the inspection gate, and as far as the room above the corner, and between the room above the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and merchants made repairs. This Meshullam, we will learn later on in the book, was related by marriage to Tobiah, chapter 13, verses 4 through 9. And he even allowed Tobiah use of the rooms established in and near the rebuilt temple. So it's interesting to realize that sometimes people may be involved but they may not be totally bought in to what the heart of the issue is. This man repaired. But after he repaired, he gave a pagan ruler access to the temple rooms. So it's just interesting to realize no work is without its detractors or saboteurs. And just because one is willing on the surface to become involved, it is not final proof of belief in that effort. Jesus talked about this in the parable of the soils, remember? There were those that were on stony ground that when it got hot, they withered. There were those that were planted by the side. Weed sprung up and choked it. We will have people that are on the surface involved, but there's no final proof of belief in the effort by what and how they behave. So there's more to this, but I, I hear the sharks out there and it must be about time for me to hush. So thank you and we'll pick this up next week.